Okay, so let's start with um, applied mathematical finance by doing a small recapitulation, a recapitulation of some foundations from mathematical finance, Gesan of theorem, for example, Numeraire, risk neutral measure, um, applications from mathematical finance, and also the stuff that we did in the numerical methods lecture. Computer arithmetics, Monte Carlo method, time discretization of SDEs, approximation of partial derivatives. So I will make use of this in the lecture. And you know, if you like, there's enough material from the other lecture that you could study this, but you can also consider it a black box and just use it. Okay, so if you are unfamiliar with some of these aspects don't panic and maybe another remark uh, for example if you do not know um, say the change of numeraire technique yeah or uh, the discretization of an STE then it's also beneficial to follow the lecture to gain an intuition for this, you know, because maybe there is another lecture where you will learn the underlying theory yeah, in a much more uh, rigorous way. But then it's also nice to follow this lecture because we will work on the level of modeling and implementation. Implementation is often a discretization so if you have continuous time finance and implement it into a computer, this is discrete time finance. So it's often then very nice to see how this is implemented to really understand um, the theory. So it is also beneficial gaining an intuition and learning the underlying theory and numerical methods. As I mentioned, there will be enough time to acquire the background. Yeah, we will start with very basic stuff, introducing interest rates. So let's start reviewing a few foundation. I will do this very quick, quickly. So we will have in one hour, say, a few relevant results from mathematical finance. Yeah. Not all, yeah, so some I will introduce when I need them, for example, or I, I will recall them, the Ito's lemma, for example. And I will have, say, all the important part from numerical method condensed now in a very short one hour se session. So first recall the relation of the numeraire and the equivalent martingale measure yeah so often denoted here with um, a q and the change of measure theorem the gesanov theorem so if you consider a complete market of traded assets so i have a market of traded assets say for example different stocks as zero as one as n minus one and these are modeled by Ito stochastic processes. So I have a stochastic process. Okay, what's the stochastic process? Let me maybe just write this here. Stochastic process means I have a map from time to x of t, and x of t is a random variable. And all these random variables x of t are all over the same probability space. And maybe you remember there is the filtration, uh, the sigma field f subscript t, and x of t is measurable with respect to the sigma field f uh, subscript t, which means that f encodes the information we know to evaluate this um, random variable. Okay, so that given, I have a family of random variable parameterized by time. And here, if these are traded asset, it is the value of the asset over time. And in the future, this value is random. That's all. That's the stochastic process. And if it is an Ito stochastic process, then it has a special form. Yeah, so here the Ito stochastic process means that 
I have a special form. So the infinitesimal change of this random variable, so this x of t, can be described by one part that looks like an ordinary differential equation and a stochastic part. So there is the sigma of t, x of t, dw. Well, I have later a comment on how to discretize this. And if you know the discretization, you really see how you build this uh, process as, at least in a time discrete version. And that's then enough. So for the time discrete version, it's enough to know that uh, a time discrete increment of the W is normal distributed. Normal distributed with mean zero and variance being the time step size, the delta Ti. Okay, so given that my market is modeled with these ETO stochastic processes, we can choose one of these assets as the numerea. So now I have here the numerea, say I choose um, S zero as my numerea. Often this is a, a bank account, so it's a traded asset. The bank account is a traded asset. Yeah, you can buy units of the bank account in the sense that you put money there. And you can sell units of the bank account in the sense that you remove money from there. So choose one of these assets as the numerea and consider the relative values. So I consider the so-called relative values. So this is here the S divided by N, the SI divided by N. So this means instead of measuring the value of the stock or of the asset in the currency, say Euro, I now just look at the relative value. So if you have the value of bananas, yeah, it means that you measure now the value of the stock in terms of how many bananas, yeah? you compare it to the bananas. So it's just removing the dependency yeah, on the currency unit here. Yeah? It's a relative price. And from Gazanov theorem, so that's the important guy here. We now know that under certain assumptions and these under certain assumptions here is for example, that the market is complete. Under these assumptions, I can find a special probability measure such that all these guys are martingales. Okay, so now I have that all these guys here are QN martingales. And QN martingale means that we have just this property. The conditional expectation of the future value is equal to today's value. So if it is an ETO stochastic process, you see this actually will mean that this part here is zero. You just have increments that have expectation zero. Yeah? So the change has expectation zero. If the change has expectation zero, the future value expected is the starting point. So this thing with the complete market and under certain assumption, actually it's just linear algebra. Uh, you really uh, like to transform the probability measure and transforming the probability measure means that your Brownian motion can kill the drift part. Okay. And if the market is complete, yeah, so for example, it's not allowed that you have two sigma coefficients being zero because then you cannot kill all drift parts. Yeah. Then um, you can you can just uh, find a measure that kills all these kill, kills all these drift parts. Okay, so that I assume Maybe you have already seen it. Uh, if not, our application is uh, a nice, uh, nice example of this application. Yeah, well, why is this helpful? Okay, so we can change to a completely artificial probability measure that has this property. So now this is really a helpful trick. Yeah? So all this stuff is just a trick. If you have um, a derivative, product, so a financial product on the market that depends 
somehow in a complicated way, whatever, on the other financial product. So now I have here the value of a financial derivative, which I know in capital T, then I can do the following. Okay, and there's, there's a small typo here. This should be a capital V. So V of capital T is just the random variable. And now I can define a stochastic process that represents presumably, yeah? so I, uh, it's a candidate that represents the value of this financial derivative at an earlier time. And I just define this guy here as the corresponding martingale, which I get if I divide by my numeraire. Yeah? So it should have the same property as the guy on my market. So then I have that this guy is a QN martingale, but now it is a QN martingale by definition. And now there's a nice tool, the martingale representation theorem which tells me that I can represent this martingale as a linear combination of all the other martingales. Yeah. Actually, the reason is since the market is complete, all the other guys include the DW parts. Yeah. So I have maybe uh, N minus one DW parts. These DWs are the uncertainties in the market. So if these are all the uncertainties. My V cannot contain more, so I can create a linear combination of all the other assets to kill or to represent the uncertainties in the V. So I have that from the Martingale representation theorem, there is some kind of representation of the V in terms of the other assets. Okay, and now it turns out that this representation can be performed in a special way. So this linear representation can be performed such that it is a self-financing replication portfolio. Yeah? So it is a portfolio and I do not need to add uh, money from outside. Yeah? So we have that we get a self-financing replication portfolio. So if you can replicate this future derivative payoff by this portfolio, that then it means that uh, this V of little t is indeed the fair value of the financial derivative, because that is the money you need to set up the replication portfolio. Okay, so what we have is that we now have a very nice method of calculating the value of a financial derivative. First step is find the measure Q. This is just the martingale property. Second step is calculate the expectation. So here we have a summary of this trick. How do we find Q? So we find the measure Q just by the condition that all these assets are martingales. Well, but an asset or a stochastic process is a martingale if the drift coefficient is zero. So I just write down all the stochastic processes under my measure QN. Very easy. And a funny thing is that it's also once you have calculated here this expectation, then it's also very easy to obtain the composition of this replication portfolio, because you just perform Ito's lemma on the left side and the right side, and you have that you can find the phi by comparing coefficients, and you will find out that it's just differentiate the valuation. So differentiate here this expectation with respect to the starting value, yeah? so you start in little t, so this is conditional in little t, the starting value of your underlying asset. Okay, I did not have Ito's lemma on the slide, 
that will come maybe also later when we need it. But if you put Ito's Lemma again, yeah, in addition here on the slide, then these two slides here are, well, the core part of the theory of risk neutral evaluation. So now you see that we have this nice little result. And this result is then my application, valuation of a financial derivative. And this result is then called the universal pricing theorem or universal valuation theorem. So viewed from that side, it is that I have now a numerea and a corresponding equivalent, equivalent martingale measure. Then I have under that equivalent martingale measure. So now I look under QN, I have my model describing the market quantities. So as Ito stochastic processes. Okay, so this here is my model, the model for my market. Then I have a financial derivative for which I know that it can be expressed as a function of these quantities, for example, at some final point in time. So, so say the maturity. So this is my payoff function. So for example, this could be a payoff function. It is more general speaking, a, a value at a future point in time. So if it is a European product that just pays in capital T, then it could be a payoff in capital T. Okay, and then I have the nice result that the time little t value of this financial derivative, so V of little t, is given by taking the expectation of V divided by N at the payment time. So at the time where I know the value. So I know that this is a martingale. So this is V of little t divided by N of little t. So I multiply with the N of little t. And I have my valuation. I take the expectation yeah, of course, conditional to the valuation time. Yeah? So it's a conditional expectation, but if little t is just today, yeah, then it's the unconditional expectation given the information I have today. <clears throat> so that is um, our setup. In contrast to the first slide, I just wrote here X are ethos stochastic processes. So it's not necessary that X are traded assets, financial products. So it could be that X are some other values. So the usual application is that you have a model for traded assets, but as we see later, yeah, it's also often much better from a modeling point of view to model other quantities, quantities from which you then may derive the traded assets, for example, interest rates. So X could be an interest rate, and then this would be an interest rate model. And V is then a derivative depending on the interest rate. Example of this situation, yeah. So the classical examples are the Black Schultz model. So in my Black Schultz model, I have my bank account. So this is a guy that does not have a DW part. So it's just an ordinary differential equation. So you know, if you have this initial condition on the right, yeah, then the solution of this guy, okay, is N zero times exponential R T minus T zero. Okay, so you have some exponentially growing um, account. Yeah, and then you can have um, the Black Scholz model for the stock. So you see the drift part here is exactly the same. This means if you look at S divided by N, it will have drift zero. Actually, that's uh, that's how we derive this part here. And you have here 
the stochastic part with a Brownian motion, yeah, Brownian increment that has a coefficient that is proportional to s, yeah, which will then lead to the fact that you can divide here by s, okay, you can divide by s, then you have here a ds divided by s of t, which is the derivative of the logarithm. Okay, so you see that this can be transformed to um, another process of which s is the exponential of this other process, so s is actually log normal. We can have a look at this. Or the Bachelier model. Now I write the Bachelier model maybe in a slightly different form. Okay, the bank account part is the same. And then S divided by N should be a martingale. So here it is just a sigma dw, there is no S in front. This is then the Bachelier model. Okay, and then we can ask the question, what is the value of a European option? So a European option on the stock. So at a future time, capital T, I'm interested in what is maximum S of T minus K and zero. Okay, that's the payoff. And from that, I would like to know the expectation. You can simulate this in the computer. Here's time. Maybe here's your capital T. Then the drift part, you know, so that guy here, will create some exponential growth. And the diffusion part will then create sample paths that wiggle around, around this. Okay, and you will get then at the final time some kind of distribution normal, log normal, yeah, shifted, whatever. And from that distribution, I take this function and then the expectation. We studied this in the numerical methods lecture. So we have already at hand some code. Yeah? So maybe you can have a look here uh, that generates this simulation and the code is very short. Yeah? It's just these few lines here, uh, which use all the building blocks that are already there that we can use to build the models. The building blocks are small, yeah? can be studied easily, but just to illustrate this, here we create the model, the time discretization, the Brown in motion, the time discretization of the process. And then we can plot, for example, here, the Plague-Schultz model. These are sample paths of the Plague-Schultz model and also the Bachelier model. Okay, and you can see a little bit how the models differ. Okay, this looks a little bit symmetrical here. Yeah, so this is, yeah, a little bit more skewed. Yeah, so this is a log normal distribution, this is rather normal distribution. You do not see this exponential growth. Uh, well, this will be seen if you, for example, make the volatility parameter here a little bit smaller, uh, say something like 5%. Okay, then you see there is this growth. If I make it even smaller, say a uh, 1%. Now then this is more prominent, okay? Can also make here the R parameter larger at 20%. And now you have an exponential, really exponential function here with very small risky part with very small diffusion parts. Okay, so you can study these different versions of the model. You can look in this uh, repository yeah, and just run the code. Another 
section, interesting section from numerical methods is computer arithmetic. This will not be so much relevant in this lecture, but I really like to repeat it because it is an important topic and it's really very easy to explain because the way the computer calculates your results is well, not exactly what mathematic is prescribing, actually say due to rounding errors. So very trivial errors. And in some situation, it can happen that you get completely unreasonable results. So it is good to understand how the computer is performing his calculations. And at the core of this is to understand how the floating point numbers, you know, so double precision floating point numbers, single precision floating point numbers, so a subset of the real numbers, yeah, a small subset, are represented. So the IEEE 754 floating point numbers are given by, so actually three sets. So this here is the first set, the so-called denormalized numbers. This is the second set, the so-called normalized numbers, and there are two additional numbers here. Okay, the set contains some integers. There is S, which describes the sign. So there is here the sign. So there is here the sign S between zero and one. And you see there is here coefficient minus one to the power of S. That decides if I'm on the left side or on the right side. Okay, so then I have two other integers here. There is the C and there is the exponent E here in the first set. Let's look first here at the second set. This number C, runs from zero to two to the power of P. So this means the numbers that I'm representing here, these are just C divided by two to the power of P. This is just something that is between zero and one. Okay, then I also multiply with a small number here. Yeah, but since one is not included, this small number is also not included, though these numbers are just these numbers here in this interval. Yeah, but these two bounds are not included. Okay, in between, I just have an equidistant distribution of numbers. Then that's just, that is the first set. Then if I move to the second set, I have something very similar. I now have one plus C divided by two to the power of P. So this is something that is in between one and two, two not included. So this is actually this guy here. And then all the numbers from there to there, but this guy, not included. And then I have a factor two to the power of E. So this factor two to the power of E, this will constitute actually the starting point. So this is just this level here where we start, yeah, where we start the scale. In between the scale, I have an equidistant partitioning, but um, since the scale is just multiplying with a factor of two, the scale becomes larger and larger. Okay, and of course the same on the other side. I have growing scales of equipartitioned numbers. And I have the two numbers plus and minus infinity, which can also be represented by the computer. Okay, so this is how the computer represents the floating point numbers. The problem now occurs that every arithmetic, inf uh, um, every arithmetic operation you perform in the computer is followed by some rounding. 
So rounding is actually a mapping that says, okay, the result of the operation is the floating point number that is the nearest representative in this set. And this rounding will lead to the effect that one plus epsilon is just equal to one for an epsilon, which is larger than one, yeah, but small. You can just see this in this picture here. Just take a small number represented here in the computer. For example, I just take here this little epsilon. Okay, it doesn't need to be the smallest number. Okay, let's take here this epsilon. So epsilon is just this distance. You see epsilon is not the smallest number that is possibly represented in the computer. Now, if you add this small epsilon to say this number here, say this is my one, and now I add this epsilon. So this here is one plus my little epsilon. Yeah. It's my epsilon. So that this result of one plus epsilon is rounded back to one. Okay, one plus epsilon is one for something that is larger than one. You can also look at this small experiment. I create a variable in the computer that is one. I create a small number in the computer that is 10 to the minus 16. I calculate X plus epsilon. So the two result is 1.0. And then I have a lot of zeros and one here. And then I just print X, print epsilon, print Y. Yeah, x plus epsilon, and I check is x equal to y. Mathematically, you would say x is not equal to y, but if I now run this program, x is equal to y is true, and x plus epsilon is equal to one. This really depends on the size of the epsilon. You can make it a bit larger, 10 to the minus 15, and you see that now the computer has enough digits to distinguish the result from the X. So this is false. Uh, you can also make it much smaller. Yeah, You can take a 24, which means that the computer can still represent epsilon. So it's not that the resolution is too small that he cannot represent the epsilon. The problem is he cannot represent the result of the operation. And that can happen yeah, quite in the background so that we do not uh, see it yeah, very easily. That was a small recapitulation from computer arithmetic. So we have to be aware of this. There is a, another uh, link here to this code. Yeah? So this was just my small rounding experiment, which you can find here in, which you can find here in this uh, repository, yeah? so in case you'd like to play with this. The next important numerical method I would like to review is the Monte Carlo method. So if you go back to our application for a mathematical finance example, that's here. So an important task here is that I need to calculate an expectation of a random variable. Okay, so I have to calculate expectations to numerically calculate expectation. And a very powerful method of doing this is the Monte Carlo method. So let's shortly review this. So maybe you recall the strong law of large numbers. So here, a little bit reformulated as my Monte Carlo approximation. So if Z denotes a d-dimensional real-valued integrable random variable, and if I have, um, say, a sequence Zi of IID random variables that have the same distribution as Z, so all over the same uh, probability space, maybe you remember, yeah, you could build the product space. Then you have the result that 
taking the time average, so if zi, if the i is like a time parameter, taking the time average of the set i, so taking the running average one divided by n, the sum of zi, then this converges to the expectation of that. So sometimes this is called the space average. So you can approximate expectation of that by just taking the average of more and more independent random variables having the same distributions of that. Later, we will apply this, yeah, which looks a little bit uh, yeah, forbidden uh, by just plugging in a sample path omega. Okay, so if you plug in omega on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, well, on the right-hand side, the expectation is just a constant. Yeah, you can consider the conditional expectation being a random variable, but here is the unconditional. Then you could say you can take samples of zi, and since zi is having the same distribution of z, you can take samples of z. And if you average samples of z, you can approximate the expectation. This looks a little bit forbidden because we have this result only in probability. Yeah? So, and if I have something in probability, I do not know anything about the pointwise uh, properties. So it looks forbidden that I use this also for individual samples. Yeah? So I have to use it on random variables, but there is a theorem that justifies that we can also use it on um, individual samples. So maybe you know this result, yeah, taking more and more IID random variables and averaging them approximates the expectation. In which sense do we approximate it? Yeah, probability, but do we also have a convergence rate? A convergence rate can be derived from the Chebyshev inequality. So maybe you remember the Chebyshev inequality from school. You can derive using the Chebyshev inequality, the Monte Carlo convergence rate. That means if mu is here your expectation. So then I look, what is the distance I have for my approximation for a fixed N from the mu? So the probability that this is larger than given bound epsilon is becoming smaller and smaller. So the probability is sigma squared divided by epsilon squared. Consider these constants. You know, the sigma is just here the variance, you know, the standard deviation, sigma squared is the variance um, of my random variable. So then I have that this becomes smaller and smaller as n increases. Okay, so I can make the probability to lie outside a certain corridor smaller and smaller by increasing n. Alternatively, you can just substitute here the epsilon and you can just prescribe a certain probability. So moving to the inverse um, event, yeah, I get a one minus, so I get the opposite estimate. So with a prescribed probability, one minus delta, if I choose delta very small, I'm only far, uh, I'm only small away, yeah, I, I only have a small deviation from almost uh, sure, yeah. So with um, a prescribed uh, probability, one minus delta. The probability is larger than one minus delta that I stay in this corridor, sigma divided by square root of delta, square root of n. So as n becomes larger, this corridor here becomes smaller, so it becomes smaller like one divided by square root of n. So this is like a probabilistic convergence rate. I converge with one divided by square root of n.
you can use this result to perform integration, to calculate integrals. That's a very nice application because if the random variable z, which we had on the previous slide, is actually a function f of x. And if x is uniform, okay, then you know that um, expectation of that, so the guy that you approximate, So what we have here, or say what we have here, so the guy that we are approximating. Yeah, this is expectation f of x. And since x is uh, uniform on zero one, this expectation is just integral from zero one f of x. Well, the density is just one dx. Okay, so I can approximate an integral of a function. You know, and of course you can change the domain yeah, by just substitution. I can approximate now an integral of a function by just performing random function evaluations and averaging them. So what I do on the left-hand side is I calculate f of xi and I take the average of this. So this is my Monte Carlo integral, an approximation of the integral f of x dx over the domain from zero one. You can also derive now yeah, the same error estimate. So I have a probabilistic error bound the probability that my Monte Carlo approximation, now my Monte Carlo integral deviates from the true integral by not more than this error bound here is larger or equal one minus delta. Well, and I give me um, a small delta, so that is then my confidence level, one minus delta. The magic of the Monte Carlo method, yeah, which is maybe overlooked on all these slides here, is that this error estimate does not depend on the dimension, dimension d. Yeah? So this is a function that depends on the dimension, but you still have independent of the dimension here, the convergence rate one divided by square root of n. And that's the reason why the method is so popular, especially in complex high dimensional models like interest rate models. I mean, black Scholes is just a single stock, yeah, a single, source of randomness and maybe just the dimension is increased with time steps you know, which add dimension but often you can solve this yeah in in, in a lower dimensional setup but interest rate models are very easily 40 dimensional or whatever so that's the reason why we will then turn to the monte carlo method Yeah, for the Monte Carlo method, uh, what do I have to do? I have to generate random samples. Yeah? So I have to generate drawings of this xi because this, what you see here, is uh, formulated in terms of sequences of iid random variables. But when we will use this, we will use it by choosing a fixed sample path, omega, and choosing a fixed sample path, omega, and having a sequence of iid random variables means that I generate random, random drawings of the random variable x. Yeah? So xi has the same distribution as x. So this means that I generate here a random drawing of x.
So I need some tool to generate random numbers in the computer. Okay, so we need to generate random numbers. Again, you might say, okay, the previous result holds only in probability. How can it be justified that I now consider this as being a pointwise approximation? Yeah? This can be justified. Yeah, there is um, a theorem stating that if the random sequence has a certain property, yeah, you can get a non-probabilistic um, error estimate. Okay, so I need to generate random numbers. That is another building block we will use. Yeah, you can use it as a black box, a random number generator. We will use from numerical methods. So usually you find implementation and I often use them as black boxes of pseudo random number generators. So it is an algorithm that generates a sequence that has properties like a true random sequence, but of course it is an algorithm. It is not really random. So we have generators for random numbers being uniform on zero one. But what we need, for example, if we go back to our application, our application from mathematical finance. So here, what I need is, for example, the DW or the discrete analog here, the Brownian increment WTI minus uh, WTI plus one minus WTI. This is normal distributed. So I need to sample a normal distributed random variable to generate here my random variable X yeah, of which I then calculate the expectation. And there is a nice method yeah, that allows me to do this, uh, to generate samples of a random variable with a given distribution. So if u is uniform, u is now my uniform random variable. And if I have a distribution function, say if I have the distribution function f, then if I just take here the inverse of f and apply it to the u, then the random variable f inverse of u, so that random variable, let's call it x, this random variable, is f distributed. So this has distribution function f. And for many yeah, distributions, we know either analytically or approximately the inverse of the distribution function. For example, for the normal distribution, I know the inverse of the distribution function. There is no closed form. I do not know it analytically, but I do know an approximation that is more exact as the machine precision, as the rounding error of the computer. So as the stuff that we have just seen in the computer arithmetic as this epsilon rounding error. So for the computer, actually, it is indistinguishable from an analytic implementation that would be exact. So I, I just need an approximation that is more exact as the computer could calculate anyway. I have such a formula and we also have an implementation. And I have a small experiment here. So maybe you can look this little guy up yeah, here in this package, in this Repository, I just uh, show it to you. Okay, so we have random numbers, this guy here. So what I do is I just specify here how many sample points do I like to have, yeah? So maybe I just take a few, one ten thousands. I have a uniform random number generator. This is a popular one, Mears and Twister is a good random number generator. So then I loop over all those sample points. I get the uniform random number from this 
generator. And then I, I, then I apply the inverse cumulative distribution from the normal distribution to this uniform to get the normal sample. I just um, add this here to two lists, which I then plot as um, a density, so as a histogram. I just plot a histogram. Let's run this little, little program here and plot the result. Okay, so on the left, you see the histogram of the normals. On the right, you see the histogram of the transformed guys. Uh, and maybe you also spot a few patterns. For example, I believe that this peak here is the guy that has been transformed to this place here. Uh, well, here it's going quite fairly. And maybe this peak here could be, could be this guy. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so you see, it's just a distortion. It's just a transforming of the uniforms to a normal distribution. You see that my guy should have analytically density one, but I have noise here. Yeah, this is noise because I just use a finite number of sample points. I just use 10,000. Yes, let's use 100,000 yeah, or let's use 1 million. Let's use even more. Yeah machine is fast enough. So that's the uniform, that's the normals. So you see, if you use more sample points, it becomes smoother, yeah? So actually this error here that you, you do not get the exact analytic density because you have just a finite number of random drawings in your sample. This is called then the Monte Carlo error. And you see that the Monte Carlo error becomes smaller as n increases. And this is exactly what we had on the slide. So here, yeah, you see that my error becomes smaller as n increases. Okay, so you see all of these things are connected, yeah? We use now the random numbers in the Monte Carlo method to calculate the expectation of yeah, the future payoff of a financial derivative, for example. Yeah, and next step I have, if we go back to our application here, you see that I have the model described here in terms of this strange notation, the Ito stochastic process. But what I need is the expectation of this random variable. So there is the V of capital T here. And the V of capital T is a function of X at later point in time. So for example, if it's just a European option, it's just S of capital T. So like here in my application, it's S of capital T, and I would like to have the expectation of this. So question is, if I have this description of the stochastic process as an ETO stochastic process, which means I know these coefficient function here, maybe this is the specification of the model. And I know the initial value, initial value and coefficients. How do I generate the value of this random variable? So the value of the stochastic process at a later point in time. So how do I generate S of T if I just know the coefficient function sigma and R, and of course also the, the initial value. No? I just know these guys. So for Black-Scholz model, there is an analytic formula. But for a more complicated model, there's maybe no analytic formula. So the next topic I need from my pool of numerical methods is the time discretization of stochastic differential equations. And seeing this, yeah, also just seeing this on the next slide, it's just one slide. It's very also very nice to understand what is an ETO stochastic process. Because if I discretize it in the computer anyway, it's good to understand the discrete version. So 
Starting with my model, my Etro stochastic process, so my dx is mu dt plus sigma dw. Okay, and I have here an initial value. First, I have to say this is just a short notation. So this is just a short notation when you apply on both sides the integral. So for example, I can apply on both sides the integral from zero to t. Okay, if you apply this integral from zero to t, well, integral from zero to t dx of t, this is just integrate here the x. Okay, this is just x at capital T minus x of zero. So what's on top here, this differential notation tells me the infinitesimal change of x is equal to something. If I apply the integral, then it tells me the change of x between zero and t is. Yeah? Of course, the change of x between zero and t is x of t minus x of zero. So what do I have on the right-hand side? Well, on the right-hand side, I have just take the integral sign and move it here in front. So I have the integral mu dt and I have the integral sigma dw. So if you move now, so if you move now the minus x of zero to the other side, okay, and this guy stays on the left-hand side, you have x of capital T is equal to x of zero, the initial value, plus the integral of the infinitesimal changes. So this guy here is the integral of the infinitesimal changes. And the integral of the infinitesimal changes is a norm normal Lebesgue integral. Well, with a little complication, there is x of t here inside this coefficient. But if this would be, for example, like uh, yeah, in Black Scholes model, if it would be now the logarithm of the stock, then would this would be a constant coefficient, just an r dt. Yeah? Actually, for the logarithm, it would be r minus one half sigma squared dt. So you can analytically integrate this. And you have this stochastic integral. And now you define this stochastic integral like you would define the Lebesgue integral with elementary function, but you can also think a little bit of it as for a riemann stieltis integral. So you take a discretization of here this guy and you have here w of ti plus one minus w of ti as an integral and you multiply with sigma at an intermediate point. And this is exactly the Euler scheme. So this is the short notation. This is the specification of the stochastic process. One part is a Lebesgue integral. The other part is a stochastic integral. And the Euler scheme is now creating a time discrete approximation of my stochastic process by performing this here in small time steps. So what we will do is I will take a time discretization. So I have a time discretization Ti, uh, zero is T zero, then T one and so on up to Tn. And I now do the above for a small time step. So I consider the integral from Ti to Ti plus one. Then I get like here this representation, but now here with a Ti and a Ti plus one. This means that I define X of Ti plus one is equal to X of Ti 
plus this integral, but in this integral you have still the x. So what you do, you know the previous point and you approximate this with an x of ti. So you just plug in an ti here. to approximate this time step. This means the next value at the next time step, x of ti plus one is equal to the previous value at x of ti plus where if I in uh, if I set mu of t, if I plug in ti to the mu, then for this integral from ti to ti plus one, this mu is a constant. So the integral is just the mu evaluated at ti and x of ti multiplied with the time step size. And the same for the stochastic integral, it's just the sigma frozen, yeah? so evaluated at the starting point, starting time, ti, x of ti, multiplied with the stochastic part, delta w. And now I know that this delta w, so the delta w is the Brownian increment. So I explicitly know what this guy is. This guy is normal distributed with mean zero. And standard deviation, square root of delta ti. And now you suddenly have a very nice rule. Yeah. So you start with the initial value x of t zero, and you just evaluate your coefficient functions with these known values. You multiply here with the time step size, and here you multiply with a normal distributed random variable. We know how to generate normal distributed samples. We just did it in the random number section. And you have an approximation for the random variable at the next time step. And since these are approximations, so I used the word approximation, since these are approximations, I have here on top the little tilde to highlight that this is not the true stochastic process I'm get generating. I'm generating an approximation x tilde. But we have a convergence result there is strong and weak convergence. So you can look at what is the difference of your true solution. My true model and my Euler scheme approximation. Yeah. You can either look at this as taking the supremum over all differences over all times. From that, uh, the expectation, yeah, it's the absolute value here. Um, okay, this is less or equal a constant C, yeah, that just depends on the time horizon and you know, on some properties of the coefficients, uh, times H to the power of one half. So you have strong convergence of order one half, uh, square root of h. Okay, so what is the h? h is the step size of your time discretization. So if you make your time discretization finer and finer, so if you have twice as many discretization points equidistributed, then you get here a square root of two improvement. Yeah? Um, I also have weak convergence where I do not look at the expectation of the supremum. I just look at a fixed time, little t. So for any fixed time, 
little t. There you see the little t. I look at the differences of the expectations and then I get a higher convergence order. So I have V convergence order one. Yeah, so this is just an H. Yeah, so twice as many time discretization points if they are equi distributed, the time discretization points is half the discretization error. And actually, reconvergence is the one that is relevant for us because we are interested here in expectations of functions of the random variable. Yeah? So this is exactly the quantity which I would like to see. So you see here in my universal pricing theorem, this is exactly the situation. I have a stochastic process. I have a function of the random variable at certain times. And I would like to have the expectation of this. Yeah? So, and this is exactly the quantity I'm interested in here. So I'm exactly interested in this error. So now we have all the building blocks together. Yeah, random number generation, Monte Carlo method, uh, Euler discretization. Um, in my implementation, I use a slightly generalized Euler scheme. So here I had the stochastic process X, which is my model, and I discretize the X. The usual situation is that I use some kind of background process, Y, and my X, yeah, so this is here my X, which I am interested in, uh, is actually only a function of this Y. And I perform then a discretization of the Y, so this is here my Euler scheme of the Y. And then I apply this function F. Yeah, so I have here some kind of function F to the Euler scheme approximation to get Euler scheme approximation of the Y to get the time discrete stochastic pressure um, process X. This general form is handy because sometimes it is much nicer to discretize a function, yeah, the inverse of the original model, and then retransform to the variable because this reduces the error. An example is the Black Schwartz model. So you make, may now look here at our little experiment where we plotted the sample path of the Black Scholes model. That was this experiment here. Okay, so maybe remember the plot. Okay, that's still with the ACTI parameters. Maybe I set the parameter back here. So this is here our example. Okay, and if you look now, you find here, ingredients that encapsulate all these numerical techniques. This here is the specification of these parameters in the Black Scholes model. So actually this is the mu, yeah, the drift, the volatility and the initial values, which describe the model. We will have many different models and one aim is to build an interest rate model like the Black Schultz model, so build a more complicated model. I have a time discretization. I have a Brownian motion. And inside the Brownian motion, if you look inside the Brownian motion, you will see that there is the random number generation. Okay, so there is the random number generation from the Mersenne twister and the inverse cumulative distribution function, just as we did. And then I have an Euler scheme, which performs this discretization using these coefficients and the Brownian motions. And that's all. Okay, I have also another helper class, the random variable. Uh, maybe we can have a look at this later, which uh, performs some nice calculations on random variables. So you may have a look at these implementations of the different concepts and some of these numerical methods are 
insight there. And let me just conclude my little tour through the numeric methods. You maybe recall that the replication portfolio had this nice relation that actually you differentiate the value of the derivative with respect to the value of the underlying, yeah, your, your market quantity. And if this is an application we will look at, then we have to know how to approximate partial derivatives. And this can be derived very easily from um, the Taylor expansion. Yeah. So for example, if you use the Taylor expansion, which you see here for a function V, yeah, V like in our example, um, for just N equals one. So the residual term is the term with N equals two. Yeah, you get this little expression here. Uh, v of X plus H is equal to V of X plus first derivative times h plus second derivative times h squared half. And now you can solve this for the derivative you are interested in. So I'm now interested here in, in the partial derivative. So this means I solve for dv by dx and I divide by the h and you get the well-known finite difference approximation v of x plus h minus v of x divided by h plus a residual term. Okay, it had an h squared, but since you divided by h, the residual term now has um, h, and this is your error estimate. So you can approximate the partial derivative by this finite difference. So time is up, but for those who like to play a little bit, I have a very nice experiment, and the experiment is calculate the partial derivative of the exponential function, exponential x, in x equals zero, using this and as a numerical method, and make h very small or very large. You will then see that for very small h, you will get problems due to the computer arithmetic, due to the rounding of the computer, you will get numerical errors. And if h is very large, you will get problems due to this term. So in practice, approximating a partial derivative is not so trivial as just choosing a small h yeah, and making the error small. And the picture you will see if you make this little experiment here, which you can study, is this nice little picture. So this is the error. So here on the y-axis, you see the error of the derivative of the exponential function. Yeah, so this is just a very simple function here, exponential of x at x equals zero. I know analytically differential is exponential x at x equals zero should be one, but the outcome is not equal to one. So I have some errors are due to due to rounding and some errors are due to higher order terms in the Taylor expansion. That was it for today. Next session is interest rate structures. Thanks. <laughs>